Welcome back to a new video. Since my last video, Croatia beat Brazil on penalties. Netherlands clawed back a 2-0 deficit, only to be denied by a defiant Martinez. Winners of Arabian and African hearts worldwide, Morocco sent Ronaldo and teammates packing. And France advanced to the semi-finals at the expense of England after Kane sent his penalty to Mark. So with the World Cup quarterfinals having been completed, I thought it'd be a great idea to sit down with Rav Singh from a little history of the Sikhs and put his knowledge to the test about Sikh history and the countries that made it to the quarterfinals. Why did we pick Rav Singh, I'm sure you were asking? Well, listen to this from the last podcast. So I don't think there's any country that I can't find you Sikh history. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. So you've now started with the hardest one for me with Croatia and Brazil. So Brazil, they've, they've had a Gurdwara there since 1987. You know, it's called the Shiri Guru Arjan Dev Gurdwara. But when I read into it, it was really a Mata Subagor Khalsa. And the way if I say the name Khalsa, you kind of start thinking it was kind of a 3HO. You know, they were in America. Her husband was Brazilian. They moved to back to Brazil from everything they learned in New Mexico in the 3HO. Then they set up in 1987 a Gordora in Brazil. But when I was thinking, look, Brazil, you know, Gordoras are the easiest one, I find. You know, I try not to say, oh, there's a Gordora here, there's a Gordora there. But Brazil is interesting. But then obviously it was a little thing a, a couple of weeks ago, we strolled out with Neymar, you know, and put like a sick on the yeah. globe. <laughs> yeah, that was insane. <laughs> that was that, amazing. I got that back. 20, 30 times in about 30. I said, I am watching the match. Don't worry. Yeah, I didn't see yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> but I think, I think within about two WhatsApp groups, we worked out how his father was from West London, engineer, gone out to Doha to work on the World Cup. Because of that, he was into that kind of structure where they were looking for mascots. And that's how it all happened, you know? So he is a, he, he is a West London boy. So no, that was Brazil. And Croatia is actually quite interesting. I am trying to navigate that storm of missing Udassis from Guru Nanak. You know, the Uganda, Turkey, Vatican route is starting to be mapped out. And I don't really have any other evidence based other than these people on um, the internet. And it's hard for me because people always say to me, oh, good and that you went to the Vatican. And I was like, no, it says a person from the East visited the Pope you know, uh, with a friend. It's that kind of thing that's being said. And I, you know, not that I can read Latin, but we need to go to primary sources. And these are all tertiary if that but the missing link was okay then if Guru Nanak Dev Ji did an Udasi to Vatican the simple question is he didn't just appear there he had to travel there and the Turkey one's been kind of discounted now you know and then Croatia was on that list so there would have been a route through the Balkans through Croatia and that's why in my head it was always like if I ever did Eastern Europe and um, that's what I'm looking for but I I just haven't got the technical expertise to link all these things because I just think there's probably four to five hundred Sikh historians before these Google theories came up on the internet. And, you know, the, how can you have a missing Udasi in the lot of good enough? You know, you know, do you know what I mean? That's that felt very internet. So I, I'm not a fan of that theory. But when I go to schools people keep still bringing it up it just did the whatsapp round so much so that's why when i get to croatia i'm thinking that's where there must be some some connection it must, that's the only way i was going to go to eastern europe so that's brazil will be croatia bro what about england versus france i wanted to bring up one thing on england that i don't think anyone's ever covered um in these talks that i've seen on your ramblings channel is if i said to you where was the first punjabi school in england what would you say the first, the first Punjabi, Punjabi school. school. So either it's going to be relate, it's going to be connected to, to to some type of like governmental post somewhere, or it's going to be a very small group of Punjabis who came over and and set up their own kind of school, like education system or school or whatever. But here in the UK, what they were trying to do in the 1830s was trying to establish a um, civil service structure in India where the people were brown in colour, but white in kind of their ways. And that's why Oxford University, through someone called Benjamin Rowlett, started to look at training up Indians who were invited over. And these are the, these are the, there was an Education Act in the 1830s. And then they opened up the Indian Institute in Oxford. So it's on Broad Street in Oxford, in the middle, near, um, near the colleges. And actually, you go into the Indian Institute, and outside, it's got all the iconography of India. And it's got an elephant on the top as a weather vane. They haven't got the cockpit, they've got the elephant. And then they've got the, the cow on the side of the building. And it's in Oxford University. I think all the Oxford Sikhs don't even know about it, right? But now it's a private institution. But you go in and they were training people, like Westerners training in Punjabi, Farsi, Gurmukhi, that kind of, um, sorry, Persian, port languages, Hindi, obviously. They were, and then Punjabi was coming up because Punjab, obviously, after 1849. So they would travel out 
to India after tr learning the languages. And then later on, they were inviting Indians to come into Oxford to learn about the civil service and the structure in that same institute. <laughs> you know, when you said it was uh, something, someone, Rowlett, who had said, oh, is, is this the same yeah. guy who then... Oh, who's... no, sorry, sorry, not Rowlett. No, 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 let me get the... You're not the Rowlett acts from 1990. Yeah, because I was going to say, is yeah. it related to that guy? No, 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 let me... Jowett. Jowett, Jowett. sorry. Okay, okay. okay. J-O-W-E-T, -E sorry, man. Jowett, and there's a Jowett Lane, and he was the head at um, Balliol College. So that was his institute, and he was, and Balliol had the larger proportion of Indians. Yeah. Because he was very friendly and he wanted to believe in this way that we could bring Indians over, educate them the Oxford way and send them back to India to run the country. But actually, the opposite was true. They came into this country and they all turned into freedom fighters, but they went back to India. <laughs> so we found out a little bit about one of the first Indian language schools in England. So what about the winners of that quarterfinal leg, France? As you know, I was in Saint-Tropez last year, you know. But what I came back with from Saint Tropez, I was looking at General Allard. So General Allard has um, his property and his family in Saint Tropez are still there. Now we have the three statues through his great 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 grandson, who set, he's the tourism minister there, Henri Allard. You know, so he's got Maharaja Ranjit Singh statue just near the yachts, and together with Bannu Pandey, who is his who is his great 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 grandmother, and then General Allard. But what I did is weaved through the streets and I found a mansion, which is now a boutique hotel, um, where the Allard family stayed with their seven children, where he built the house. And then you go up to the top and you see how links with the Punjab and France are described. And I was trying to work all this out. I was thinking, look, the Allard family, very well to do, but all their money was made in Lahore because he was a general. He went to find work. So how did he make the money? You know, so then I've just just written written this research paper, and what what I'm trying to, or what I've published is this really. I'm trying to weave the Sikh story with the story of the Kashmir shawls, because what happened, Amar, is that General Allard was in Punjab, and he was expanding the empire with Maharaja Ranjit Singh's blessings. So he got took over Kashmir, and in Kashmir, the the shawl industry was in decline, big decline. But what happened is Maharaj Ranjit Singh patronized the arts, which he did in Multan as well in other places. And he revived the Kashmiri shawl industry by saying, make these shawls and send them to Lahore. You know, so that that got the weavers on side because there's obviously a dying breed. But then, you know, that that kept that industry going. And then he set up another cloth um, shawl making place in Amritsar to actually pump up the trade because he was paying his generals in not gold coins, he was paying them in shawls as well. So then what he did, General Allard came, so he had five children and he was worried about his young wife, Bannu, who was like 17 years his junior, I think, when they got married. She was 13 and he was like mid-30s or something, right? And by the time she was 18, she had three or four children. And he was worried about, look, if I keep going on doing these campaigns and I get killed, there's a Sati situation going on here. So he said to Maharaj Ranjit Singh, look, I need to go and educate my children in France. So I need long term leave. I need like a year's leave to set their education up. In reality, he was taking his wife back to, to Saint-Tropez to say, actually, you know, at least the children and you are safe here in case I die in battle. What he then did, he picked up all these shawls. <laughs> right, took them with him to France. And then he was then also, um, the trade was much smaller in those days between Paris and Kashmir in the old days. But it's known that Josephine, who was Napoleon's wife, she was wearing um, Kashmiri shawls. And what that then happens is you open up to all the royal families in Austria, and they're all wearing these Kashmiri shawls, you know. So he's taking French goods to Lahore and bringing these shawls and other um, artifacts back to France and then that's how they made so much money because all the royal families are just buying them all over Europe and they can't get enough of these shorts you know and then that's the revival of the industry and there's two books by Frank Amos which I've now had to buy and go through them and he talked about it all you know, and all about the Sikh design that started to show a fiery spirit in the design of these shawls, you know, and the colours and all this kind of stuff and it all happened and then you go to Saint-Tropez today and it's just full of boutiques, designer boutiques. And really, in the 1830s, you had Bannu Pandey and her husband 
the basically the equivalent of designer clothes you know so that's the first round of quarterfinal games dealt with starting with the next round it's netherlands versus argentina i will let you pick which country you want to start with yeah let's go with south america because argentina is interesting if you look at argentina the climate of argentina is very similar to the climate of punjab in that they do farming agriculture fields all that kind of stuff so really why we haven't got a bigger punjabi population in argentina is a mystery you know it's possibly because of the the time and length it takes to get there, right? But once you're there, the climate is very hospitable. Now, Argentina, we went there to build railroads again in the 1910s. You'll find the early the early people like California and like Kampala, they went to build a railway in Argentina to trade goods, and they took Sikhs there, um, and that's fine. But today, what you'll find is um, a gentleman called Simranjit Singh Man, I think, Simran Pal. Singh Man, I think it's Man, his surname. And he's called the peanut prince of Argentina. So if you look on the back of a packet of peanuts, it's going to be China or Argentina on the back. Produce all. If you've got Argentina, you know, it's basically, there's about 300 Punjabis in Buenos Aires and around that. And they're all employed in the agriculture industry to do with peanut production, all owned by this Punjabi, you know. And basically the tonnage they come out with is huge, that they're the second largest supplier of peanuts in the world. And because he's got a bug and he's got the, you know, the, the star and the height and everything, he's called the peanut prince of Argentina, you know. And they got a gurdwara, right? they got a gurdwara right in Buenos Aires. But it's basically, it's their Gurdwara for that company. <laughs> what about the other team in that game, Holland? But you, know, you know what I was going to tell you about the Holland? I was going to tell you about the Maharaja of Nabba. But there was a guy called Robert Nicol Matthewson, you're right? And about 70, I think when he was 70 years, he sold a Rolls Royce in the shape of a swan. Okay. <laughs> and so he's called the Swan Rolls Royce. There's only one in the world. And then the Maharaja of Nabba bought it off him and he commissioned Rolls Royce to make a baby version of that for his son. And that is kept in a museum in Holland since 1990. But it brings out the whole thing about how these Maharajas are so affluent that he could commission Rolls Royce. I want a mini version of that for my son. And lastly, the first African country to make it to the semi finals of a World Cup, Morocco, and their opponents, Portugal. I'll give you Morocco first. So there's a massive mosque in Morocco. Okay. Every postcard is called the Qutubiya Mosque, the Mosque of the Booksellers. So this story then takes us back to Maharaja Jagatjit Singh of Kapurthala, who marries the Maharani Prem Kori Koda, but it's a meter, to be honest. They marry in Madrid, they have their time in Paris, and they end up in Morocco on honeymoon. And they end up in Marrakesh, they end up at the Qutubiya Mosque, and she likes the mosque, she likes the design, the architecture, as we all do. So then when they get to Kapurthala, he basically builds a replica of the Qutubiya Mosque in Marrakesh, Morocco, and he builds it in Kapurthala. So it's called the Moorish Mosque in Kapurthala, identical to the Qutubiya Mosque in, um, in Marrakesh. And Portugal is a hard one for me, because Portugal, when you were in Lisbon, I was really trying to dig, dig, dig. And really it was going to, basically the Portuguese had an East India company as well, but their time was much earlier than the British East India company. It was actually in the main palace the offices of the Portuguese East India Company were in that palace. And there are banknotes and coins, but really, I think in the Maharaja Ranjit Singh's time, that kind of trading relationship would have still been going on, but the Portuguese were phasing out as the British were coming, you know, made their mark on Punjab. Well, I think the only c connection that I can vaguely remember, and I might be incorrect on this, so I'll have to double check, but... um. There's the, what is it, Xavier, Jerome Xavier, the Jesuit priest or whoever who witnesses Guru Arjun Dev Ji Shahidi and then writes back. And I'm sure he's Portuguese. I'm sure. So that's it. That's all the quarterfinals done there. 